cool sitting there and hearing Pastor Mel say, you know, I have no idea what Andy's going to say. And I said, that makes two of us. You know, it's really, you know, uh, part of my journey in the Lord has been, you know, I've, I've been one who's, who's really pursued the Lord and, and been very diligent to study the Word. I wanted the Word in me. I want the Word to be truth. But there came this point in my life where the Lord shifted me out of preparing sermons and preparing messages to preparing myself and and stepping out in faith and allowing the Lord to draw out of the well and trusting that he's going to lead me in, and lead us into all truth and the truth that is necessary for these people right now in this room. Uh, and if I rely on my, my, it's not that I don't prepare, believe me. <laughs> Um, but if I rely on my notes or uh, my memory, then you end up getting uh, the ministry of my mind rather than the ministry of the Spirit. And, and I'm not advocating that anyone else approach ministry that way. That was a very specific dealing with, with me. Uh, and uh, last night before I went to bed... I don't know why I don't always pray this, but I just prayed and said, Lord, you know, we're, we're here. We're in prayer to shame. Um, Lord, if you need to, to give me a dream to show me or anyone in our family, we have Noel, especially she gets dreams regularly. But, uh, you know, in the scriptures, it says that the old men will dream dreams. Well, last night um, I got a dream and, uh, and it wasn't really that pretty, honestly. Uh, I dreamed that I was in a long hall and that down the hall I could hear my daughter being beaten and being abused. And I shot up out of, you know, it's one of those things where you're trying to wake yourself up in your own dream. And, uh, and I'm trying hard to wake myself up because I, I'm, I'm feeling like this is really happening. And then all of a sudden, you know, I finally do wake up and I realize they're right next to me. I mean, we're in one motel room. This is not happening. And, and I was a little disturbed about that. And as I continued just to kind of pray and press into that, I really believe that it has something to do with what God is doing in this church and in this city here in Prairie to Shame. Because you need to understand that... This is a very hurting region of Wisconsin. There are a lot of people that are trapped in darkness, that are pinned down, that are being hurt, that are being abused, that are crying out, but they're crying out behind closed doors. And, you know, it's one thing to get touched by God, and, and I love the worship that you all have here. Don't get me wrong, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's nice to be able to come out of all that, come out of ourselves, and come out of the world, and just... Just draw near to Jesus together and to be able to use the songs to be able to do that. I love that. Um, but you know what God is doing in your hearts, if it just gives you warm fuzzies here, it's not enough. It's not enough for what God's got on his heart. He's always going to be trying to explode and get out in what is deposited here. That it empowers you, that it transforms you, that it moves you into a whole different mode of life. So when the world around you feels like everything except some Jesus culture worship music. When it feels like darkness, when it feels like chaos, when it feels like war. That in your inmost being, you've got a river flowing. Because the Spirit of God is not this little sensitive member of the Trinity who gets his little prissy feelings hurt all the time. Or you've got to get the atmosphere just right. Or he's just going to flitter away like a, like a frightened little dove. He is the third member of the Trinity who hovers over the chaos and brings order. Do you understand that he is a fire, he is a rushing wind, and that he breaks through all our mindsets and traditions and just shows up with the reality of God and will touch people in ways that they need to be touched and that only God Almighty can touch them? Well, I share that uh, 
partially because as I've, as I've been in the Word, God gave me kind of a, an analogy that has helped me. That um, if you can, and we went through this, we went through a failed adoption. It was, it was not a fun thing. We had a little one-year-old African-American boy that we had brought into our home. His name was Zion. In about the one-and-a-half-month period, uh, we got a nervous phone call from the adoption agency. And uh, things played out, and we had to surrender him. Uh, it turned out that the birth mother was not honest and that the birth father uh, was more involved and had intentions to parents and that she was trying to work around his his desires. And we had no idea. We really didn't. And so we had completely let our guard down. You know, there was no guard. He was my son. You understand? Yeah. He wasn't like adopted son. He was son. Yeah. And we need to understand that God has adopted us. He predestined us from the foundations of the world. God is a father. And, he's, and he, the father is gazing upon the son for all eternity. Pouring himself into the son. And the son is receiving the fullness of the father. And bearing forth that image in glory. And he's taking all the life that the Father and the glory that the Father puts into it. And he's loving the Father back. And how are they doing this? They're doing this in the Spirit. And the Spirit is just this river of love and glory flowing back and forth. And they say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could share this with others? The Father's like, I would love for someone besides myself to gaze upon you, son, because I get so much joy just gazing upon you. Do you understand? This is the first relationship. This is the primordial relationship. When God created us, this is what he had in mind. He had in mind to take all that's been going on for all eternity in the invisible realms and make it visible. Well, how? By creating human beings that he could dwell inside. That you now get hooked up and get to participate in all that he is. But something happened. God created us to be sons and daughters. And we got kidnapped. We got kidnapped and we didn't realize it. We, he created us to be rulers. Let us create man in our image and let them rule. Do you understand that when God created you, he created a ruler? You might not look at yourself that way. You might look at yourself as somebody who is trying hard as a struggler. God does not see you as a struggler. He created no strugglers. He created rulers. Not to rule over one another but to rule in life, right? It says in, in Romans that by the grace of one man, we now reign in life through Christ Jesus. So you can, you've probably seen on the news where there was a family that had a, 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 maybe a girl, usually a girl that was abducted, like when she was five years old and and then all of a sudden now when she's 16, somebody finds her and she, she gets, you know, pulled back in and she gets rescued from being uh, raised by a kidnapper. And you find out that the kidnapper had been mentally and emotionally and physically and abusing her in every way. And one of the things that the kidnapper had been saying is the reason that you're here with me is because your parents don't love you anymore. This is all your worth. All kinds of things. Raised in the basement in chains and darkness. Lying about the parents. Sowing seeds of worthlessness and all kinds of stuff about who this child is. And now the child is set free and brought back into the original family. You need to understand something. To those parents, 
as damaged as that young lady is now, their value for her has not changed one little bit. This is our child. This is the one that we gave birth to. This is the one that has a glorious destiny. This is my heir. This is the one who gets absolutely all of me. I hold absolutely nothing back. See, you know, when we bring our friends' children, when they come over to our house, we love them. But there's parts of us they don't get because they're not our children. But when you are adopted into the family of God, the Father gives to you as much as he ever gave to Jesus. He gives all of himself. He holds absolutely nothing back. You have been made a co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand? He doesn't get his portion like this huge pile, you know, and you get this little smidge off the side. That is not the way it works. You are a co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17, Jesus talks about this. He's, he's really talking about this. But this is one thing I just want to nail down. Do you understand? That those parents who bring this rescued, kidnapped girl back into the house, they make a distinction. They choose not to treat her as the kidnapped, as she now believes herself to be. They choose not to treat her as she has come to believe that they that she they feel about her. They've been she's been told your parents hate you. And sometimes she's gonna react out of that. Do you understand? But the longer that she's in the house, the more that she can catch the vision that her parents have of her the more her heart is set free to become who she truly is. Yeah. And do you understand that that's what you and I are all going through? That is the renewing of the mind process. That we didn't realize that God was creating us to participate in Christ. You know, I'm going to share how this came about for me. I, um, I remember blowing it really bad. I did some no-no sin. I can't even remember what it is to this day. I don't know what it is. Maybe I watched something that I should have turned the channel. Maybe I, I just gave full vent to my, my anger. You know, said something. I just, you know, you know you shouldn't have. I can't remember. I don't know what it was. And I had been through seminary, been a missionary, been a pastor. Kind of, you know, one of those things where, you know, by now, you know, I mean, pastors aren't allowed to sin. You know that, Pastor West? You understand that? You're not allowed to have a bad day, a bad moment, and you're not allowed to stumble. I just want to let you know that, brother. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I, I did, and I don't know what it was, but I remember it was kind of like God knocking me off of my spiritual high horse, and I just was left down at ground zero. Lord, I'm here in your presence because of the blood of Jesus. And I just remember the presence of the Lord just swooping in so strong. And it wasn't like, you know, I had to beat myself up and feel bad over it for three days. It was like, wow, that's, that's, I was just amazed. And I was just so loved by God. And he spoke something to me, you know, because I started to kind of, you know, get ready to get out of that quiet time mode and get ready to go, you know, live my life again. And I started feeling this, you know, I need to try harder. I'll try not to ever do that again. I started, I came home as a prodigal. And I, and I said, you know what? I'll work really hard for you, Dad. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, I'm not worthy to be called a son, but I'll work really hard since I'm in your house. And God said, no, 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 no. This is what he said to me, though. He said, Andy, your Christian life, <laughs> he said that to me. He said it in a really nice way, though. It wasn't a voice of accusation. He was just trying to encourage me. Let's don't do that again. You know, because you have in this mindset, 
All these things that you try to do to build your relationship with God. And if you're not careful, you end up trying to use Jesus to build your relationship with God. Right? Yeah. You use the Bible to build your relationship with God. You even use the church to build your relationship with God. And if you're not careful, you're just using everything around you, even good and holy things, to try to build your relationship with God into what you think it should be for it to please you and to please God. And God just looked at me and said, Andy, don't do that. Your Christian life, it sucks. But here's what we want to do. Let's take all of your efforts to live the Christian life and your efforts to build your relationship with me. And how about we set those all aside and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a deal. I'm going to give you my son's relationship with me as your relationship with me. And I just went to my knees and I said, glory. I mean, because you... You, you're used to seeing other people have perfect relationships. And you see the way that the Father loves the Son and the way the Son loves the Father. And you're like, wow, I get that? Yeah, Galatians chapter 4 says that the Son was born under the law to redeem us who are under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, you might not understand this. Because you're still thinking of your life as an orphan. Thank God I'm not an orphan, but I belong in the house and God loves me. But listen, you don't understand what you've been adopted into until you get the Father's vision for what He was doing when He brought you into the family. And the Father knows what Son means to Him. Son means this glorious one that I've been gazing upon for all eternity. That I supply all of myself to him. And I see the fullness of my glory in him. And this is the one through whom I make the heavens and the earth. This is the one for whom I make all things. This is the one who will rule and reign forever. And guess what? I'm adopting many other brethren to stand in that place with him. Amen. To share in that place with him. Do you understand that that's a whole lot better than you feeling bad that you didn't get up early enough to have a quiet time? Yeah. And feeling like God rejects you for that day. Wow. Now, I'm not saying that having time alone with God isn't refreshing, good, and even necessary. But it's not necessary for, for, for God to feel good about you. It's good for you to know how God feels about you. To refresh yourself in that. To drink from that river that flows from his throne. That's what that's for. Okay? So, what does this have to do with relationships? This is everything. This is everything. We are so used to, we get this, and, and we, it, we come in, we believe in Jesus and ask Jesus to be our Savior. We come to church, and then we just try to get along. And we, we get along not so well usually. Sometimes, you know, we, we don't have relationships with one another. We, we, we love the pastor. Or we love the worship. Or we love the youth ministry. Or we love this program. Or we love that program. But listen, if that all went away, do we love one another? Do we love one another? Do we even know one another? Do we allow one another to know ourselves? And I'm not talking about this soulish thing of like, okay, I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me when I was five years old. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> because you know what? I do not have to know you after the flesh. I really don't. I really don't. I do know you after Christ. Because I look at you and I look right past all the stuff 
And I say, you know what, Father, let me see them through your eyes. Let me, let me feel them through your heart. Because this is the one that you left the throne for. This is the one you laid down the sun for. This is the one that you shed your blood for. And you begin to see them as co-heirs, co-rulers, members of the body of Christ, holy, blameless, free from accusation. And you speak those things into them. Because sometimes we start rehearsing what the kidnapper programmed into us. Uh, I'm never going to amount to nothing. Me and God just, why does he do this for everyone else, but don't do nothing for you? You know, and, you know why did he look at me that way? And why didn't they say anything to me when they came into the room? And all these little empty echoes of our heart searching for love and affirmation and and tell me that, that I matter. And we come to the church and we're like, well, I better matter here, darling. Jesus died for me. And we throw, we project all this selfishness in Jesus' name on one another. And we relate to one another out of expectations. I know what God expects of you. You're supposed to do this for me. 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 You're, to to me. You're not supposed to speak that way to me. Don't you look that way to me. I know, I know who I am in Christ. <laughs> All right? Am I preaching good? <laughs> now, I don't know a single one of y'all. <laughs> I'm not preaching at anybody. You understand? I've been through it. You, I've been through it. I know that's going on here. I know I'm addressing some mindsets. But Jesus said something that was really kind of cool. And I, uh, in John, we don't have to turn there. I just want to read it. In John chapter 17, he prayed this. He said, I'm not praying on all for all those, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. Do you see that? The first relationship. Just what we had going on in the beginning. Just what I now came and lived on the earth. Do you understand that Jesus got to make it visible? What's been going on for all eternity. Why did he do that? Because he said, I want you to be with me. Because I'm going to send you out to preach this message. But the message is this. That God Almighty is one with us in the Spirit. Through me, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The way that we get hooked up to that is through Jesus. And how do we know the Father? We know Him as our life. He shares His life. We don't live us anymore. We live by the divine nature that we are partaking of through faith. He comes to live in and through us. It's awesome. It's incredible. But he says, listen, he says that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you understand? You have a they in us. You have a they in us. So it's not enough for me to know who I am in Christ. I, and I need to live out of who I am in Christ. And I need to know you and who you are in Christ. And I only speak spirit to spirit. I only relate spirit to spirit. You know what? Your flesh is dead. And I don't have to kill it. I might walk away from it. Do you understand? I don't have to fear it. I don't have to fix it. I really don't have to fix it. But what I can do is help you realize it's all fixed, honey. It's all fixed, sir. It's all fixed. That old, you don't have to fix it. Just recognize it. It's old. It's gone. And that spirit, who you really are in Christ, that fire that's been had the leaves, Smoldering over the top of it, we kicked the leaves off and threw a nice big hickory branch on there. Let it burn. Let it blaze. Let it blaze. 
And that's what we do. We speak these words of life to one another. That does not mean that we turn a blind eye towards sin or something like that. But you listen. Paul writes to the Corinthians, saints in Jesus Christ, right? Enriched in all spiritual blessings and gifts that are abounding in you. You guys are just, uh, you know, and what is he doing? He's focusing on where do I see Christ in them? How do I see Christ now? There's a lot of flesh going on there. He did not start there. He started by recalling to their mind and to their heart, heart who they were in Christ and how, they, how he sees Christ coming out of their life now. Right? And then he says, this is not you. This is not you. This is not you. Just like a parent who gets the kidnapped child home, they make that distinction. You know what? That ain't her. This is her. They speak that vision and that value. Oh, honey, we missed you every day. We cried over you. We prayed for you. We are so glad you are back home. We will never let you go. Everything that that man did to you, thank God, it's in the past. It has nothing to do with your future, honey. It's got nothing to do. We have to do with your future. We are going to make sure that you are taken care of. We're going to make sure that you've got to, that you're able to do everything that's in your heart. Your past is past. It's gone. We're not going there anymore. And every time you see your past coming out in the present, listen, you just need to let that go. Get back into the place where you're hearing these things that we're telling you. Get to that place inside of you. You know, Jesus often said, he said, where is your faith? You know, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> Go find it. <laughs> he really did. So I want to share a few principles about how I've seen this work just practically. Can I talk about supernatural relationships just yeah. for a little bit? I think I've been talking a little bit about it, but you need to understand this is not just uh, you do your best and try harder and, and those kind of things. This isn't just advice that you could get from Dr. Phil or Oprah Winfrey or any of those, those folks like that. These are not just relational skills. This is about opening up your inmost being so that what God sees, feels, knows comes out through you. So that you can open up your inmost being and receive and discern that which is coming from God from another person. And be safe with people instead of having to protect yourself from people. You know, Jesus, he spent his whole time around unregenerate people who were arguing, the closest ones who got it the most, they were arguing, who gets to be in charge? Who's got the highest rank? At the Last Supper, he washes the feet of all the disciples who are, he knows are going to abandon him. And he, one of them, one foot was a heel that was lifted up against him to betray him. He washed that one too. And we all have a choice to make. Are we going to treat people as they treat us? Or are we going to get our inmost being filled and saturated with the grace of God and just let God loose on them? And let God love on people through us and it's not about us anymore. Amen. We really have that choice to make. We do. And we, when we have Christ, we have that power. We're unstoppable. So, in the book of Philippians, it's really kind of cool. I see some real principles here, and I want to want to bring those out. But before I go there, I'm going to start at the at the basement level. What about people who aren't believers? You know, because you know they're not believers. <laughs> they're they're unregenerate. How do, how do we treat them? Well, in, in James chapter 2, uh, somewhere in chapter 2, it is written somewhere. It's in James chapter 2, John. Uh, you, it, the Word of God says this. 
How is it that out of the same mouths you can praise God and then curse another human being who was made in the image of God? So what is that telling us? That God would never have us curse another person. No matter what they do. And you listen out there. People are running one another down all the time. Why do they do it? Because they treat one another on the basis of how they make them feel. How do you make me feel about me? Or they treat them on the basis of their performance or their expectation, right? But God says, don't treat them that way. You don't speak to another human being that way. How do you speak to them? You speak to them as one from God's point of view. I created them in my image. That's how much value I give to them. God says love one another. Love others as you love yourself. Let me ask you, is God a hypocrite? No. He created us. God so loved the world. He looks at the world and he loves each person like his very own self, which is why he came and died in our place. What would I want to want someone to do for me? And he looked at your needs and identified your needs as his needs, your value as his very own life. And so when, when, when we're out and about, there's times where, you know, I meet, I meet somebody, I know they don't know Christ. They're out on the streets, they're probably prostitutes, or they're probably on drugs, or they're this or they're that. And, you know, sometimes the, word, the Lord can give a specific impression that's really just for that person, very specific. But you know what? Oftentimes, I don't get that. But I am able to speak to them a prophetic word because I can speak in faith, in love, in the power of the Holy Spirit, from the vision, from the heart of God. And I can say, listen, I want to let you know that your whole life you have never come to discover how much value God places on you. And you need to understand that you are so incredibly important to God. I want to let you understand, do you understand something? That God gave his own son up for you. He shed his blood for you. He wants you. He's got a glorious destiny for you. He did not create you to be empty. No, it doesn't matter what other people have told you. You are important. You are valuable to God. And right now, he's inviting you to come home. Scott free. He's not holding your transgressions against you. He held them against Christ. Come on home. You know, it doesn't have to be a full gospel presentation, but I'm telling you, when you speak to people and you cause them to see the value that God has on their life, and you speak to them that way, instead of treating your waitresses on, you know, on basis of how quick they get the food out, yeah, or your cashiers about how long the line was and whether the change was accurate. You know, if they made the inter incorrect stuff, you can let them know, but you can do that without devaluing them as people. Do you understand? Yeah. It, it's, it's about how do you value them? How do you value one another? Do you speak? Do, your whole life should emanate the vision that God has for human beings. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. yeah. So it's awesome. It's awesome when that's going on. Amen. Well, how many of you guys know that you start coming together in church and people start talking about loving one another and then all of a sudden some people hear that is, gosh, I really need to try hard. And then other people start hearing that and they start saying, hey, that'll be good. I could belong in a place like that. I've, I've been looking for people to love me my whole life. <laughs> and then they're like, they just become like this big sponge. Like, love me, love me, love me, you know. I need this, I need this, I need, you know. It's like, you know, sometimes you run in, in, in to people. And I've found, this is one thing I've observed, real clo close and personal. You can tell how people are relating to God by how they are relating to the church. Those people that are that way, needy, 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 always problem-oriented. 
towards the church, you listen to their prayer life. Oh God, I need this, I need that, I need this. Not real close. So the whole supernatural and the job of Christian leaders in the church is, is helping people realize what they have been given, where life is. Life is not found here. Life flows from the eternals, from the spirit. It's in Christ. And so all this need, 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 you need to know that everything you need is in Christ and he supplied it to you fully. Now just drink. You need to learn how to drink. You need to learn how to eat. Get you out of your mouth and put Jesus Christ in your mouth. Put him in your mouth. That's what he was saying. Eat me. I am true meat. What you got in your mouth? Stop putting your problems in your mouth. They taste horrible. Stop putting other people's faults in your mouth. That's even worse. Put Jesus Christ and his living in your mouth. His flesh is true flesh and true life. His blood is true life. Sometimes you just need to put all that Jesus is in your mouth and all that he's done in your mouth. And that sets you free. It fills you up and washes you clean. And you need to learn how to do that for yourself. But you can do that for other people. You hear them. Listen, you don't need to be impatient. Did you hear that sermon the other night? And don't be doing that. You know, but when somebody comes to you, you can hear that. And you can help them be, get, move from hearing and thinking out of the, the mind of man, that leaning on our own understanding, that way that seems right to a man, and you can move them to listening to the Spirit, seeing who they are in Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Well, Philippians is an interesting book because Paul, he's heard that there's problems in the church. There's two leading ladies, and you don't see this until the end because Paul's pretty sneaky. <laughs> He's, he's just laying the groundwork of, uh, the whole way through. But in, in Philippians chapter 4, you say, hey, help these two ladies, Eudokia and Siddiquity or whatever her name is. I can't pronounce it. Pastor Mel, you have to help them out. I have no idea. You know, they're fighting. He says, help these two ladies work it out. But apparently these were so, this was causing trouble through the whole church. Have you ever had that where somebody's got an issue with one other person, but they're in such positions of influence that they start recruiting a team. And before you know it, the whole church, you're not treating another person as another person. You're treating them as an issue. You've got this, instead of Jesus being between you, you got this issue between you. Yeah. And you've made that issue Lord of your relationship. And you're determining everyone's value, their value and your value, based on how they, whether they bow down to your false god or not. That issue you've made an idol. Because you've made that more important to Je than Jesus at that point. It doesn't mean you're not going to have differences that you have to work through. You just don't let the problems become issues that get between you. Hey, let's get on the same side. Here's the issue. We don't see eye to eye, but it's not between us. Let's let's see if, if there's grace to work that out. Sometimes there's not grace to work it out. You just say, you know what? Let's just get past this, and it'll work out as we walk. <laughs> because Jesus is Lord. I've had that with brothers and sisters that we said, you know what? I don't know if I see eye to eye on, on this particular issue, but... Who cares? Let's just, I see eye to eye on Jesus and I love you and he, you know, we're going to move past this. So you just keep walking. After a while, you get further enough down the road like, what was that we were busting about back there? You know, it's just amazing how Jesus does that. So I'm going to show you something. Philippians uh, chapter 2. If you've got problems, if you've got issues in relationships, I want to show you something. Because this is key to being a powerful witness in your community. It's key to being a powerful witness in your church. Philippians chapter 2, it says, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Look, do you know sometimes you get focused on a problem and the problem solvers among us we start focusing on it, not because we want to focus on a problem, it's because we want to fix it. 
But you know what? The more you focus on stuff, the more power and influence it has in your soul. And here these people have been having issues in the church this whole time. And Paul says, listen, if there's any encouragement in Christ, let's just start by saying, where is it? Look for the right stuff. You might have 90% problem. Okay, fine. If there's any encouragement in Christ, let's find that. If there's any fellowship in the Spirit, let's find that. Let's focus on what's going right. Let's focus on where we do see Jesus. Let's focus on where we are experiencing the love of God. You know, it's awesome. The encouragement that you have that might not be in your relationship. The encouragement's in Christ. There's no discouragement in Him. So if you're discouraged, I want to let you know that's not from Jesus. Get your eyes upon Jesus. And that will stir up some encouragement. You start rehearsing that. You know, consolation of love, that's awesome. You go through stuff. Everybody does. How would you like to go through it without the love of God? Wow. So sometimes we're all focused on, why, why, why? Oh, this hurts. This is tough. Man, man, man. Hey, think about, think about this. You've got God's love in the midst of it. He's made you stronger. He's loving you in it. Isn't that good? Good. Let's focus on that. Let's keep our eyes fixed on that. All right. So, and then he makes a shift and he says, make my joy complete. You know what he has them do? Focus on Jesus and focus on bringing, building godly joy in other people. Get your eyes off of you and your feelings and your problems and this and that and the issues. Focus on the encouragement that you've got in Christ, where you are seeing the, the Spirit of God, where you can find the good thing, and focus on that, and then focus on the God build, building godly joy in other people. I care about your walk with God. I care about the joy of the Spirit in you. I don't want to do anything that's going to cause you to stumble. You know, gosh... Paul's sown so much into us. You, mean, you, know, you start caring about how Jesus feels about the way that you're doing stuff and relating to one another and how your pastor feels and how your wife feels and how your husband feels. And it's not that you make their feelings Lord and that you become a people pleaser, but you care about their godly joy. Amen. Not, their, not their whims and issues and you better not go to Haiti because there's dangerous stuff over there, you know. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, it's Jesus' idea that we take up our cross, I think, you know. You understand? we got to go for it, folks. Our lives are laid down. All right. So look, and then he says, do nothing from selfishness. We get that all the time, right? So get, stop being selfish. That's pretty supernatural. But then he says this, have this attitude in you which was also in Christ. So what did he do? He let go of all of his rights as God. He said, you know what? Here I am in Isaiah. Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. And the angels covered their eyes and covered their feet. And they're holy, holy, holy. That's what he was used to. That's what he had in the when he was existing in the form of God. He had all the rights and privileges as God. He set it all aside to become a little baby in a manger. Holy smokes. Unrecognized. Ch chased around the hillsides and all this kind of stuff. Rejected. I'm thinking the angels are kind of like, what is he doing? What is he doing? But do you understand that Jesus gave up his rights? What was rightfully his because he was focused on the needs of other people, of bringing them into the revelation of God, of bringing us into the household of God. That's, that's what it comes to. And you know what? He had to go all the way to the cross. And after the cross, then God exalted him. Boom. God put him up. Now listen. This is an illustration of to the kind of relationships that that's the way the river flows. It flows letting go of rights, humbling ourselves to do the will of God even when it's hard, to not consider ourselves so important, but to consider others more important than ourselves. 
even when it hurts. But you know what? Even when it feels like death, then you put yourselves in the hands of God and God raises you up and he says, this is the name above every other name. Well, check this out. He says, so then, my beloved brethren, just as you've always obeyed as in my presence, now much more in my absence, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So listen, he's not saying work for your salvation. He's saying work it out. This salvation, this life that saves has come into you. Now it runs down the same path. Do this. Let the salvation life work its way out through you because God's at work in you now. He was at work in Christ when he let go of all of his rights, came down, died on the cross, humbled himself. That's the way salvation life works. It sets you free from selfishness, sets you free from you so you can be free to love other people in the power of God. That's what it does. So, hey, now this life, you want that life? You got it. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. And he says it's God who's at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, his here's where the cross comes in, right? Do everything without grumbling or disputing. Grumbling, that's what our emotions do when we hit the cross. Arguing, that's what our minds do. At first, you know, we're like, man, that made me, like, I don't know why they treated me that way. I hate it when they speak that way. And then all of a sudden, you know, you got that grumbling. You know, it's in your emotions. And then all of a sudden, you know what? You start getting all these arguments. You know, they ought to just, you know, you start building up these arguments in your mind. You know, you start, I, I remember when I was at the workplace, there were times where I would write out an entire email <laughs> just to tell somebody what I really thought I should tell them. And then I deleted it because I was a chicken and knew I shouldn't say those things to people that could get me in big trouble. You know, but first, see the email, that was the argument. That was the mental justification and the argument against somebody, but it came from grumbling. It usually hits grumbling first, but this says do everything. That You know what it all comes from? It all comes from selfishness. It all comes from the nails coming into our hands and feet. It all comes from, from the whips across our back and caring so much about ourselves that we're, we're willing to devalue someone for whom Christ died. Instead of surrender to the Spirit of God and say, listen, I will love you, I will love you, I will love you. It's hard, it hurts, you don't see it, it's hard, it hurts, but I'm telling you, God, and it's not this martyrdom simplex, I want to let you know, I, you know, you're going to have to, there's a lot in the scriptures about relationships, okay? Pastor Mel's going into a whole series, so Mel, Pastor Mel, you can balance out anything that needs to be balanced, but I'm just going out of Okay, because I know how hard it is to have a supernatural relationships. But you understand this is supernatural to see people of that much value, that much worth. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Now listen, remember Jesus went to the cross, then God exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. Listen, you do all things without grumbling and disputing. You go to the cross. You do it. You do what's right. You do it in the power of the Spirit. You give people value. You give people your love. You give people your time. You give people your life. You do it without grumbling and disputing so that you will prove yourselves blameless, innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Do you understand that this is shining forth the glory of God? This isn't going off into some monastery in a hill and singing Kumbaya. This is in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. This is not because other people are treating you fair and square all the time. They're crooked. They're perverse. It doesn't mean you need to be a doormat. You ought not be a doormat. But you 
you ought not let yourself get in the way of the Spirit of God absolutely pouring forth in power in other people's lives. Okay? That is supernatural. That's supernatural. you got to understand, I have to listen to every word I'm saying. <laughs> You're sitting there thinking, boy, I wonder what his life looks like. And I'm saying, you know what? My life is Jesus Christ. And when it's life, it looks a lot like him. There's times where I'm like, wow, who just did that? <laughs> Patience came out of me. In a, really, in a really strong way. And it wasn't because I was afraid to say something. It's because I really wanted to give them, like I was giving them life. I was allowing them to, to say, you know what? I'm not going to respond in the same spirit that you just responded to me. Because the spirit that I've got in me is so much stronger that I can turn away wrath. That's right, yeah. I can turn away your anger and your harsh words. Because I've got the spirit of patience rising up in me. And I'm really loving you. Amen. You know, it's awesome when that happens. So, I'm going to show you one more thing, and then we're going to move transition this a little bit. We doing okay? Yeah. All right. Philippians chapter four, verse eight it says, "Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, of good repute." If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, I've learned this Bible verse really early in my Christian life as a verse to help me determine what I should and shouldn't think about. It was a meditation verse. Nobody ever explained to me, this is a relationship verse. How easy is it for you to focus on the negative things that you see in other people? But this is saying, listen, in the midst of all that's going on, don't let the problems and the differences divide you. He starts off with a prayer. I'm praying that, that your love may abound still more and more in all discernment. Why? So that you may approve those things that are excellent. We're taught that discernment means that out of 98% of the stuff that's right, you can strain out the 2% that's wrong and help people recognize what's wrong with everybody. That's what's going on in the church for the most part. But I want to let you know that's demonic in the spirit that drives it. We have a love for truth. And that love ought to abound still more and more in all knowledge and discernment. Why? So that we may approve, not disapprove, so that we may approve those things that are excellent. So that out of all the stuff that's going on, I can discern Jesus Christ in you. I can see what's true and I can build that up. Instead of setting aside everything that Jesus is doing in you and beating the stew out of you for the stuff that, that, that is still of the flesh. And making you feel like you're back in the hands of the kidnapper once again. That's exactly how that feels. And it's not the spirit of God. But God is able to look past. Love covers a multitude of sins. You know how it feels to come into the presence of God when you know you've done something wrong and you don't deserve to be there. But you know what? Jesus covers you and cleanses you and builds you up and, and, and reminds you of who you are and who he is to you. And you walk out of there all built up, all changed. And it's not because God took your sin lightly. It's because he took your sin and put it on his son. <laughs> Right. And he's done with it. And he's not letting that determine your relationship anymore. And he speaks to you. And he knows you didn't want to sin. And he builds that up. And when he does need to address sin, he always addresses it. Listen, this is something you're done with. Amen. This is something that you're done with. Let it go. Right? right? Amen. It's not who you truly are. That's what it ought to feel like to sit and have coffee with. That's what it ought to feel like to come through these doors. That's what it ought to feel like to be in our homes. 
that this is a place that we discern what's true and good and lovely. And I have to tell you, it's impossible to do just thinking about relationships. That's why Paul said over and over, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, he, he just, he, he said, I had all this joy. Great, go rejoice. Do it over again. If you lost your joy, I guarantee you, you didn't lose it from focusing on the Lord. That's right. So, right? That's right? The joy of the Lord is your strength. So you go back into the presence of the Lord and you just go rejoice. Go stir up that joy. Get your encouragement in Christ. Go stir up the fellowship of the Spirit. Go stir up the, the consolation that you've got in love. Get your eyes off your problems and the problems in other people. Get your eyes off that stuff and go rejoice in the Lord. Well, I tried that. Again, I say rejoice. <laughs> Do you understand there's no other solution? Eternal, this is eternal life. Life does not come from out here. Don't suck the life out of people. <laughs> Suck the life from God because he will never run dry. Yes. Go and rejoice in the Lord. And that will strengthen your heart so that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on in your relationships, you can be there as a fountainhead, as a gusher, overflowing these rivers of living water so that when someone touches you, they get touched by the presence of the Spirit of God. When someone, uh, when, when, when you squish an orange, orange juice comes out. I want to share one vision that I'm going to be done uh, that God gave me that really influenced me. It was a word of wisdom as a, as, and I was... I, as a pastor, I was always wanting to see the church grow and Christians to grow and to be mature. And then we were in a prayer group, and one gentleman shared that God had showed him a vision of a rose in bud. And it just opened up so beautifully. And then as he shared that, I saw a rose in bud and a gardener with his gloves try to open the thing up. It didn't work as well. You and I, when we're relating to one another, we often see, you know what? A church and the Christ, Christians, our Christian life, when it's in full bloom, ought to look like this. And we say, you, your life it doesn't quite look like that. It looks like a rose in bud. So... We make the mistake of going over, let me adjust you. Let me just pull these petals open. Let me, let me do this. Instead of, let me pour water on you. Let me shine light on you. Because you've got everything inside you that you need to become glorious. Because Jesus Christ lives in you. And you know what? If there's some bugs that are getting after the roses... We don't treat the roses as the bugs. We kill the bugs, not the roses. All right? So you get after the bugs, not the roses. And the God who Jesus did signs and wonders. He did miracles. He did healings. He did all of that because God is love. And all of those things that he did, he still does. And they are signs pointing to a life that he's given us to live by 24-7. Whether we're healing the sick, casting out demons, or doing our job, or loving our kids, or having a discussion with our spouse, or, or whatever we're doing, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask. 
So I want to let you know I don't want anyone going out of here out of condemnation and evaluating yourself and saying, you know what, I've, I've just screwed everything up. No, if Jesus lives in you, take this as a word of encouragement that this is the life that he's given to you. And you might have some relearning to do, but that's okay because that's good. Jesus has brought that awareness to you. But he makes a distinction. Don't you define the bugs as you. You're a rose. You're a rose. You're a rose. Jesus is not bugged by you. He's really not. And so listen, if you've got stuff going on in your bodies, or got stuff going on in your hearts, I want to pray for, for a few things right now. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to I had, a, I had a good, encouraging phone call this afternoon. You remember I told you this morning about the young man who was backed over by a tractor twice. We went and laid hands on him yesterday morning, and they were worried if he was ever going to walk again. He had five major fractures in his pelvis region. He, he pulled his feet up and sat up in the bed, stood up, took a couple steps. Yeah. It was amazing. It was awesome. Yeah. So I was like, and I got a call this afternoon, and uh, Robin and Steve Odin, who are the pastors over there in Wakhan, they gave me a call. She said, you know what? Our neighbor came out, the one who connected us with that young man, and they said, so what's the, do you have any update on Spencer? And they said, yeah, you know what? Later that afternoon, he got up out of bed and went four-wheeling for three hours. <laughs> Whether it's emotionally, relationally, or physically, Jesus Christ, He can do this love thing. He can do this healing thing. He can do this salvation thing. It's just open up our hearts, open up our eyes, open up our lives, and let's say, Lord Jesus, let's come. Let's get this thing on. Let's let heaven manifest itself on earth because you died to get hell out of me, hell off of me, and heaven into me, and out through me. And that's what this is all about. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we just declare, Jesus, you are Lord. You are victorious. I declare transformation in Jesus' name. I declare love. I declare reconciliation in Jesus' name. I declare forgiveness in the name of the Lord Jesus. I declare freedom in the name of the Lord Jesus. Washing of hearts, restoration of marriages, restoration of child-parent relationships, restoration between leaders in Jesus name Father I just declare reconciliation in the powerful work of the cross in Jesus name Father I declare newness of life Father no more the stuff that's held people back I just declare I'm walking new you're walking new in Jesus Christ a new heart you're set free from your past you're set free from yourself you've got God and you know it and it's awesome and he's enough for you. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing in people's bodies. That you love not just our souls. You love our whole bodies. Jesus, thank you that no man ever uh, hated his own flesh. But he nourishes it and cherishes it. And we are your body. You nourish us. You cherish us. I just declare healing in Jesus' name. Life in Jesus' name. All pain and affliction, you go right now in the name of Jesus. I speak healing head to toe. All pain, all affliction, you go in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your great and mighty power. We worship you. We worship you. All right, well, I want to invite people who want hands laid on them to come forward. I'd be happy to do that. It'd be my honor and privilege to do that. We will minister to people for as long as you want to receive ministry. Uh, we not, uh, we're not anxious to go anywhere. We're anxious to see you get everything that Jesus wants. Uh, Pastor Bell, I don't know if you have any further words. Wow.